Every material has properties that determine how it interacts with the world. The most well-known category of material properties is that of mechanical properties, which determine how a material responds to forces applied to it. While the names of these properties may sound familiar, strength, hardness, stiffness, density, and so on, their actual meanings can be just complex enough that most people don't really understand them. Even people who really should know better can frequently mix them up. That's quite a shame, so I'm making this video to introduce people to the basics of how materials behave under stress and what these common terms actually mean. Firstly, this video assumes that you already understand the concepts of force, pressure, and kinetic energy, and the laws of their behavior. If you don't, then you should look at them before continuing to watch this video. I feel that the key to understanding all mechanical properties of matter is knowing that forces do not apply to objects as a whole. They apply to the atoms that the object is composed of. Atoms that force is applied to will in turn apply force to connected atoms, and this repeats to transmit the force through the object. During this process, the force being applied is acting against the inertia of the atoms and any other forces that are acting on them in the same way. So when force is applied to an object, pressure is created inside the object. The force is known as the load, and the pressure is known as stress. Ideally, we can divide the load by the area of a cross-section of the object to get the stress. The presence of stress causes strain, which means any change from the starting shape or size of the object. Synonyms for strain include deformation, distortion, warping, and deflection. Most of the mechanical properties of materials relate to the strain that occurs under certain conditions. There are many different variables involved in mechanical strain, but there are usually two that need to be considered, the amount of stress and the loading direction. For example, when two forces are pulling outward on an object, that is called tension, when any forces are pushing inward against each other, that is called compression. When two forces are pushing in opposite directions to each other at an offset, that is called shear. The pattern of strain resulting from these three types of stress is different. Materials tend to fail most easily in shear, and some are more resistant to tension, while others are more resistant to compression. Several other common types of stress are often measured to understand a material's properties, and more complex forms of stress are measured for specialized applications. Some produce similar enough results that you can substitute one when another isn't available, but until you learn when that works, just make sure that you always compare like with like. You will often see people talking about a measurement of one type of stress, such as tensile strength or hardness, as if that's the only thing that you need to know. The reason that large companies can do this is that they work in industries where the relationship between these figures and a certain type of material, mild steel for example, is known from experience, so one number gives the professionals a good general impression. Internet experts also try to do this, especially with the two examples that I gave, tensile strength and hardness, because they are the ones favored by most industries, and thus they are usually available. It might be tempting to follow their lead, but if you try to guess that relationship, then you will probably just get something wrong. Now let's move on to types of strain. This is where most of the popular terms are defined. When stress starts, the first type of strain to occur is elastic strain. You can probably guess how elastic strain works based on the way the word is used. Something that is elastic will recover from strain when the stress that caused that strain is removed. An object's elasticity, therefore, is its ability to return to its original shape. Elastic strain occurs in all materials because the distance between bonded atoms isn't strictly fixed, so applying stress causes atoms to get slightly closer or further. We tend to refer to the full-scale effect as flexing, but if there is a possibility of confusion, then it's better to ensure that the word elastic is being used somehow. Elastic strain can be difficult to see for a number of reasons. It can be very small when a small load is applied, 
or when a relatively large load is applied to a stiff object. Sudden elastic strain can revert itself before a normal eye can see it. This results in the myth that some materials do not deform, but everything deforms, without exception. If we graph out the amount of elastic strain that occurs, in portions of the object's original size or shape, as stress is applied, in standard units of pressure, we tend to see a consistent relationship develop, a straight line. This makes it easy to predict the behavior of springs and other devices that are based on elasticity. The proportion of stress to strain in the elastic zone is given as the elastic modulus, the amount of stress that would be required to cause a hypothetical amount of strain. The elastic modulus in tension, often called Young's modulus, is defined as the stress required to reach twice the original length. This is usually calculated because most materials don't elastically stretch that far. The elastic modulus in uniform compression is called the bulk modulus, and it's the amount of stress required to compress the material to half of its original volume. It is roughly equal to the tensile modulus in most cases. The elastic modulus can be thought of as the stiffness of a material, but the true stiffness of an object is found by multiplying the relevant elastic modulus by the object's modulus of shape. This is because the amount of material and where it's positioned is just as important as the way the material behaves. Flexibility can mean either the inverse of stiffness or the total range of elastic strain. It's not a very exact term, and some people confusingly switch between these meanings. Once a material's capacity for elastic strain is exhausted, there are a few different types of strain that can occur next. Some, like pseudo-elasticity, are unusual enough that you don't need to know about them now. Brittle materials just break, which we'll get to later. But many important materials transition into plastic strain. The word plastic is often misused to refer to synthetic polymers, but it actually refers to the way that many of them behave. Atoms or molecules shift between different positions in the material, creating strains that do not revert when the stress is removed. Thus a material's plasticity is how well or how much its shape can be permanently changed. Once plastic strain begins, the graph of stress versus strain begins to curve, because of changes in the sites where atoms or molecules can most easily move. These structural defects are present in all normal materials, and their movements and interactions vary with the type of material so that differently shaped stress-strain curves can be created. Controlling these defects is one of the major ways of creating stronger materials. Properties that relate to plastic strain are the ones most often called strength. The first type of strength is the amount of stress at which plastic deformation starts, also known as the elastic limit. This can be found by the change from the straight line to the curve on the stress-strain graph. It can be hard to figure out exactly where that is, so more often yield strength is used. This is the point at which a small amount of permanent strain, usually 0.2%, will be left after the elastic strain is released. This is a useful measurement because stresses below the yield strength will typically cause no damage to a piece of that material. In some modes of stress, you will eventually reach the ultimate strength, which just means the highest point that the strength can get to as it deforms. After the ultimate strength, the material will either get weaker because of necking, or just break. Strictly speaking, stress can get well above the ultimate strength if it is applied so quickly that the material can't keep up with it, and you can pass below the ultimate strength if stress is applied slowly enough. You wouldn't want to design right on the ultimate strength because you could just pass it up during manufacturing and compromise the product. It uses the word ultimate, so people tend to think that it's all important, but like all material properties, it means only what it means. Another property of, usually, plastic strain is hardness. It is the material's resistance to indentation. This essentially means localized compression on part of an object's surface, but in practice it's vague enough that many different hardness tests can exist 
with each one emphasizing different effects in the material to some extent. The main benefit of hardness testing is that it doesn't change the object being tested very much, so it can be used on finished parts for quality control. This works best when the relationship between a certain hardness test and other properties of that particular material are measured in advance. Without this context, it rarely means anything. The total strain that a material can take is known as ductility. In compression, it may be referred to as malleability instead. There are many other types of strength and factors that affect it which can't be covered in this short introductory video, such as hot hardness, fatigue, and stress corrosion cracking. Keep in mind that there's a lot out there. At the end of the line, the material comes apart completely. This can happen as cleavage or fracture. A single crystal with the right crystal structure can cleave, which is when the bonds in the material break along a plane. Because of the requirements for this to happen, it is mostly interesting to jewelers and geologists. Most materials fracture, meaning that they break in an irregular pattern. Many have a fracture strength, but you probably just want ultimate strength or toughness. Toughness is the amount of kinetic energy that is required to break the material. Because energy equals force times distance, toughness is equal to the integral of the entire stress-strain graph, or the area under the curve. When a material fractures easily or with no plastic deformation first, we call it brittle. Lastly, we have density. This is the ratio of mass to volume for a material. In porous materials like wood and bone, density indicates how much solid matter is there versus how much is not, so it correlates to other properties well. But in non-porous materials, it is not directly related to strain, and is often not classified as a mechanical property. Consider that platinum, the third densest of all elements, is soft and weak. Boron has a very low density, but is very hard. There's a lot here, but I still consider that to be the basics of mechanical properties. Don't worry if you can't remember all of it. It would be strange if you could. I'll make later videos that should provide context so that this all makes more sense, and you can refer back to this video or the linked references whenever you need a reminder.